help out here. Uh, so uh, the, the League has played a small part of my story from a very young age. Uh, but anyhow, you know, I decided to run for Secretary of State uh, when Donald Trump started to collect voter information on everybody in the nation. Uh, and that really concerned me for two reasons. The first reason is that us, are the former Secretary of State sending voter data to the Trump administration caused thousands of Coloradans to cancel their voter registration uh, in a state where 5,300 votes has decided the governor's race. But above that, I, I think it was the, the first key that this, this presidential administration may be looking to roll back civil rights and voting rights. Uh, and very unfortunately, look, you just have to look to the last election. Georgia, North Carolina, North Dakota, Florida just proved us that civil rights and voting rights are not protected in the United States, that there is active disenfranchisement happening across this nation. You know, it's 100 years since women got the right to vote. And yet, we're still fighting for people to have their voices heard. So what I plan to do as Secretary of State, what I plan to do over the next four years is very simple. I plan to, to work with all of you, work with folks across the state to make sure that we have a democracy that we all can believe in. And that Colorado paves the way for the nation to have a democracy that we all can believe in. And my first priority is making sure that the franchise is strong in Colorado. Uh, it is true, we already have some of the best election systems in the nation. Uh, yeah, and, and the league played no small role in making sure that 1303 passed and that our voting rights are strong here. But with that said, just last election, we had two to three hour lines. We can do more to get more people registered to vote. So what we plan to do first and foremost is expand automatic voter registration. Do you all know what that is? Does anybody not know what that is here? So I can explain it. So what automatic <laughs> voter registration is, uh, and it's already starting at the DMV here. It, it's very simple. You change opting in to register to vote to opting out to not registering to vote. So for example, right now at the DMV, you go get your license, you renew your license, and they say, I'm gonna register you to vote unless you don't want to. That's what automatic voter registration is. We're gonna fix the program at the DMV, make sure it's working really well, switch the opt-out model, but then expand outside of the DMV. And why I think that's so important is because younger people, people living in cities, aren't driving as much. And although everybody should have a state ID, we have to face reality that a lot of younger people don't get their driver's license. Yes. And democracy should meet people where they are. Uh, and where they currently are, and where they may be with driverless car technology over the next 10 years, it may not be at the DMV. So this legislative session, we're gonna be pushing hard on expanding automatic voter registration. That's our top priority, and we would love to work with all of you to make sure that we get eligible people, whether they're Republican, Independent, or Democrat, registered to vote. What do you guys think about that? So, please give me a thumbs down if you don't like anything, so I know if you guys don't know, like something. Uh, in, in terms of the lines, look, we are seeing long lines in select places in Colorado. Uh, right now, we're looking at the data, so we can figure out, hey, what is going on? Uh, the lines tend to be in the biggest counties, we're looking at the, the makeup of the locations where there's lines, looking at the percentage of people of color, looking at the median income to see if the lines are only happening in working, place, uh, working class communities. We're looking at what's happening in the VSPCs and in the polling centers, where there are not enough printers, where there are not enough ink, where there are not enough workers. Uh, and we're, we've been working with our stakeholders, we want to work with you guys to make sure that going into this legislative session and prepping for 2020, that we are really stopping the long lines. Uh, look, people who are voting on election day, 19% are brand new voters. Brand new voters. Another 20% are updating their voter registration. So that means there's 40% of people on election day voting that would not otherwise vote if we didn't offer election day in-person voting. Uh, it's only 5% of our total population that's voting on election day, but we need to make sure that their voices are heard. Uh, and you all, look, if someone has an 11-hour job, an 8-hour job, kids at home, uh, they can't wait the two to three hour lines. So we want to fix that. Uh, and then a, a couple more ideas uh, along the election side is extending election day hours
hours for in-person voting. Uh, and that again goes to, look, if you have a, a working mom who just worked an eight hour shift and have kids, she might not be able to get to the, the voting booth between seven and seven o'clock. So let's have a conversation about extending those hours so everybody's voice is heard. Can I ask, well thank you, I'm glad you guys like that. Uh, can I ask, wait, where is the clock so I know how long? It's on the podium. Oh, got it, okay. <laughs> Uh, and the, the last thing I'll touch on on elections is our cyber. So we have some of the best cyber security in the nation for elections today. But you know, cyber risks, they always change. So we're gonna be really doubling down on cyber security. Uh, very unfortunately, my first briefing with DHS got canceled on Friday because of the shutdown. But don't worry, we have a very good IT team. So we're gonna be working across the aisle, uh, up and down governments to make sure we have strong cyber. But along those lines, our, our statewide voter registration system, so that's our, our real-time pool book called SCORE, we want to make sure that that functions in 2020. Uh, and, and part is cyber risk, but part is very logistical. To have in-person voting move quickly, SCORE needs to be up and running. And we have a history of it going down. So it's gone down 2012, 2014, 2016 on election day. Right now we're working on, and it's called a, a SCORE 3.0. Really we're building out capacity to make sure that that's ready to go. Uh, in terms of elections, you know, it, it's so important that everybody has their voice heard at the ballot box. But it's also really important, and, and I, it sounds that you guys agree to make sure that our voices are not drowned out by dark money. So that's secret political spending. That's secret political spending. Uh, and look, the reason campaign finance laws exist is to make sure that there's not corruption. That's the ultimate reason. We don't want backdoor deals happening and someone saying, hey, I'm gonna dump $50,000 into your race and not even report it to the public. We also need to make sure that foreign countries are not putting money into our campaigns because that is illegal. Uh, and we just saw last uh, election Russia funneling money through the NRA to benefit three Senate races in this nation. When we don't have campaign finance transparency, we can't even see what the heck is happening, right? So what I'm proposing is making is to make us the leader, the leader on campaign finance uh, transparency in the nation. And there's a lot of work to do. There's a, a lot of work to do on campaign finance, and, and it's, it's hard to crack the nut on it, but I'm really confident that all together, if we push hard this legislative session, we're gonna have real change that matters. Uh, and in thinking about how campaign finance, transparency should look, there, there's really three buckets. The first bucket is making sure that we have sufficient disclosure, so that we, there's not a shell game of money flowing through C4 to C4, or to C6 to C4 for an independent expenditure. And then the actual donor gets lost along the way. The second thing when we're thinking about campaign finance is coordination. So that you don't have an IE, which is our version of, of a super PAC, playing right along the side of a candidate and coordinating in, in a bad way. And the third thing we have to think about is enforcement, investigation, auditing. We can have all the laws in the world, but if, if folks know that we're not going to enforce our laws or we're not going to look into it, what's the point, right? So along those lines, we're going to set up a pretty robust process. We're going to bring some of the best top thinkers in the nation to Colorado to talk about what are the best solutions. I'm going to have town halls. I, I hope you all participate because we want the very best answers when we're going into legislative session and when I start rulemaking to make sure that we have solutions that really do work. Some of the ideas that I have on campaign finance is making sure that when a C4 gives to a super PAC or an independent expenditure, that they report the real donors, not just the C4. So taking a step back, say you have an independent expenditure that's supporting a ballot initiative or a candidate, and they disclose all the money that they get so the, the, the independent expenditure, let's call it Colorado's for a Better Colorado. And they get money from a C4 called Americans for a Better America. Who the heck knows what that is, right? We don't know who the donors are. 
So what I'm proposing and what I would love to work with all of you on is making sure that a C4 that donates to an independent expenditure has the duty to report where that money is coming from. So that means asking their donors, hey, hey, Jane Smith, John Doe, do you want your money to be used politically? And if so, we're gonna report who you are because this is a democracy and people deserve to know who's trying to influence their elections and how they're trying to do it.
Right now we have two systems. So we have Tracer, where you, you know, so you know, you've used it, it seems, in the back, uh, where everybody is, is saying who gave them money when they're running campaigns. And we have another system for lobbyists, which isn't quite as clear. We're going to be working to integrate those so we have a holistic vision of how money in politics is working in Colorado. Uh, I also really support making sure, uh, so take a step back, do you all know that during legislative session, lobbyists cannot give to the legislature, they can't donate to the legislature? So something that I really support, and I'd love all of you to consider, is extending that a little bit. So I 100% support that a lobbyist shouldn't be able to give the legislator money, a donation, a contribution, during legislative session. I want to extend that to say anybody with business before the legislature, whether you're a corporation, a lobby, a special interest, should not be giving to an independent expenditure either. You can have a legislator controlling an independent expenditure, so our super PAC, and receive donations from folks with business before the legislature during session. Uh, I think we close that and we really make sure that, hey, we're, we're not gonna accept accept people acting like that. We want to make sure everything is above board. That's not to say it's not above board generally right now, but we need to make sure that Coloradans believe in our democracy, that we really believe in our democracy. So I am just honored to be uh, the Secretary of State. I look forward to working with all of you over the next four years. Hopefully we get really good work done and continue to be the best leader in the nation. So that no matter what happens in Georgia and Florida, and we, we wish them, hope them the best, the nation can look at us and say, hey, that's a democracy that all of us should adopt. That's the way you do things. So I am really honored to be here. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'm coming. <laughs> Stand up, please. And we know, we know the leak way. <laughs> Linnea Davies, League of Women Voters of the Pike Peak Region. Um, what do you propose for candidates who totally finance their own campaign? Well, I, I think money in politics is a huge issue. It's a huge issue. Uh, and, you know, I traveled around the state. We were uh, in Brush, Colorado. 70 people show up. We go up to the mountains, go down south. Uh, and people will say, hey, you need to repeal Citizens United. And trust me, I agree. I think Citizens United was horrendous for this country. Very unfortunately, in that all those cases leading up to Citizens United, it said that a candidate can self-fund in a limit split. They can, they can put whatever amount of money into their own campaign. I don't support that. That's constitutional law right now. What we will be doing to try to even the playing field, you, you have to give me, so I'm not even done with the first week, starting on Tuesday. <laughs> By next week, everything will be solved. No. Um, we're going to be forming a working group on public financing of campaigns. There's models from across the nation. Because look, you shouldn't have to be super wealthy or super connected to run for office. That's one of the reasons that my win is really a, a, a shock, right? Because I, I don't come from that type of connection. And again, we live in a democracy. A, a working mom should be able to, to run for office. Someone who grew, grows up on food stamps like me should be able to run for office. You're rich, you should be able to run for office too. But right now the costs are just so high. So I don't have the answers, we'll be looking at that. I also personally support uh, a version of one of the initiatives we saw on, on the ballot that didn't pass. Uh, so we saw that if someone puts a million dollars into their own campaign, other people in that campaign can raise five times as much of the, the now limit. The problem with the ballot initiative that we saw is that it also allowed the self-donor to increase their contribution limits by five. So imagine that, imagine you're a working person, you have a $400 contribution limit, someone you're in, in, up against dumps a million dollars in and then suddenly everybody gets five times as much. Who do you think has the better network, right? So if we can find a way that it's not the self-funder who gets the five times as much limits, and it's just everybody else in the race, I think that's, that's really good. Look, it's, trust me, it is very hard to raise money. 
that it's very hard to raise money. Uh, so if there's any way to even that, either through uh, you know looking at a possible amendment or through public financing, we're really going to be focused in on that. So I don't have all the answers now, but we're going to set up a process that hopefully we, we reach some pretty good solutions. And, and I hope uh, you know we will probably start that that work around May. And I, I hope that you guys would like to have a seat at the table. We have one more over here. Um, Jean Bradley from Adams County. Um, you mentioned you have you have town halls. How can I find out the date and the time of those in place? Yeah, I would love for you to come, Jean. Um, they're not scheduled yet, so we'll be scheduling them over the next two weeks. We'll hope to start them in February. Uh, we're also going to be inviting some of the, the biggest neighbors on campaign finance across the nation to Colorado. Those will also be open to the public. Um, so we're reaching out to folks right now. So just give us a couple of weeks. We'll post everything. If you follow us uh, either on Facebook or Twitter, uh, we'll try to get the information out. And we'll make sure to let the league specifically know when those are happening. We have one here. Yes. Then Laurie from uh, Golden. Where is that one there? I um I was in Denver in Denver too. My question is, I mean, I love everything you're talking about. I think they're very important issues. Is your office well funded to accomplish those? You just kind of yeah. No, that's a really good question. So, in terms of cyber, we have 46 positions that just do our IT in the Secretary of State's office. So we're very blessed to have one of the best IT uh, divisions in the nation. Could they use more money? Of course they could. Of course they could. Uh, but we were just given uh, $6 million of HAVA funds uh, about six months ago or so, so we do have some extra funds. But one of the things that I will be doing is fighting for federal funding. Look, nationwide, the last time that we had a big infusion of money for our elections are in the machines was quite a while ago. The technology is old. In Colorado, we have moved to the next generation of election machines. The rest of the nation hasn't. Uh, we have paper trails, the, the audits, we have a lot of safeguards in place. But look, what happens in all these other states can affect us. It affects who goes to Congress, it affects the presidency, and I'll fight for that. Uh, in terms of campaign finance and, and lobbying, investigation, and enforcement, we currently do not have those positions. We don't have enough positions. So we're looking uh, across the nation to, to really determine what the setup should be, and then we'll be asking the legislature to allow us to fill those positions. Uh, elections, we have a great election team, a bipartisan election team that has really been working hard. Uh, but there, there's, look, if anybody wants 2020 to work really smoothly, it's all of us and we'll be working around the clock. Uh, so the Secretary of State's office is not funded through the general fund of the legislature. We're predominantly funded through business fees. And so, you know, our, yeah, so it's a little different setup. So currently we don't have enough personnel to do everything we're talking about, but hopefully we'll, we'll get the permission to have those personnel from the legislature. Okay, my Abel County. Uh, there's currently a bill introduced in the Colorado legislature to make election day a holiday, uh, replacing Columbus Day, just would you comment on that? Sure, um, I, I think that bill, Senator Aguilar, and I can't remember who, who the representative is, it was recently introduced. Uh, look, if we can get more people to the polls, that's a good thing. Uh, I do think we have to be cautious about this bill, and I look forward to speaking with the legislators about it, uh, because younger people, people in college, really vote on election day. So my top concern is that the, that holiday does not extend to colleges. We want college students in school. We do not want them skiing on election day. They need to be there to get their voices heard. Uh, you know, uh, another concern that I have is working families. So let's say we, we do have a, a working mom, and she's only working six hours that day, and she's gonna go go in person that day, but her child care facility is closed because it's an election or because it's a holiday. So I, I love the concept. I, I think there's things that we really have to think through. Uh, the, the concept of, I, I love the concept of having election day be a holiday, but not really, the con not really that concept. I love the idea that we make it easier for people to vote. We need to make sure that this actually does that. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. okay. 
Hi, I'm Jerry Cummins, uh, State Board and Arapaho Douglas League. I applaud your uh, interest in cybersecurity. I just want to give a word of caution. Colorado doesn't have a lot of track, a strong track record dealing with computers and security and all that. And CDOT was hacked a year ago. Um, when we expand automatic voter registration, and I say when, I would urge every every caution that the security is still there as we go to the other agencies throughout the state. And perhaps you have a comment on that. I 100% agree. Uh, so to take a step back in terms of our cyber, look, none of our voting machines are connected to the internet. We have a paper trail. We have signature verification. I'm looking at a list. Bipartisan judges monitoring in-person voting and, and counting of ballots. We have audits of the ballot. And then we, we invite people in to hack our system. We invite private sector to try to get into our systems. We invite the DHS, Department of Homeland Security, to get into our systems. We also ask private sec private companies and DHS to come into our systems and see if anything is compromised. So I, there is a, a very strong, I, I guess, dedication to our cyber. But what you're bringing up is one of my top concerns of expanding automatic voter registration. You know, our election systems are some of the most secure, and if we're expanding out and interacting with other agencies, we need to make sure that if information is going back and forth, that they're secure. So part of the legislation, uh, and we're working through it right now, you, you hit the, the right in the bullseye, is making sure that we have the ability to confirm that other agencies are as secure as us before we open up that next step to automatic voter registration. Look, uh, it is my top priority to make sure that every eligible person's voice is heard, but we can't compromise our security. And the Secretary of State's office security is, is really high. We are also a very high target for cyber attacks. So that's something we're working through right now. I, I look forward to working with the governor and the legislature to make sure that we have really good solutions so that we're not taking one step forward uh, and, and end up being pushed five steps behind. So really good point, and we're working on it. We have one more question to finish up the day. Yes. Hi, Jenna. Sylvia Bernstein from Boulder. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your historic win. Uh, secondly, can we count on your support of national popular vote? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I, I think national popular vote is a great idea. Uh, the only caution that I have is that we don't go into a constitution, what is it called, a, a constitutional assembly. Yeah. Um, is that the right term? I'm not thinking yeah. convention. <laughs> convention, there we go. Let's not go into a constitutional convention. Um, but yes, yeah, so I support national popular vote. Look, again, uh, this is no longer the 1700s. It's not the 1800s anymore. People think that a democracy works in a specific way. We need to make sure that we're offering uh, voting, that makes sure that everybody's voice is heard. We need to make sure that the results of the voting results in people's voice being heard. Uh, so I 100% support that, and we'll be at the legislature trying to get that bill through also.
Tell your next door neighbors that this is a huge priority. Campaign finance is hard. Switching how we do things is hard. But there's, we have to remember, this is the best thing for our democracy. And people want this. Whether you're a Democrat, whether you're a Republican, hey, I, I you know, I, Estes Park is not the, the liberal stronghold in the state, right? Uh, and especially me growing up 20 years ago, it's very conservative, it was very conservative leaning. You can ask your Republican next door neighbors, do you believe that unlimited amount of secret money should come into our races, to our campaigns in Colorado? And I'm gonna guess a lot of Republicans will say, no, that doesn't seem like a good system. John McCain led campaign finance reform at, at the, the national level. We're gonna need help on getting that through. Uh, so I look forward to, to working with all of you. Please call your legislators and tell them campaign finance reform is a priority because having a good democracy is a priority for me. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, I, I look forward to working with all of you over the next four years. I know it may sound like we have an ambitious agenda. We can get all of this done. Uh, we just need all of your help. And again, I don't attest to have all the answers. So please continue to work, bring us ideas. We want to partner with you. Uh, and thank you so much for having me here. Thank you for everything you do.